So thank you everybody for joining us at the uh, Digital Frontline Club uh, on uh, the 1st of October uh, for this uh, interesting, what I'm sure will be a very interesting panel on freelancing, freelancing the frontline perspective, but also looking at the future of news uh, from a freelance perspective. Just going to give it a few more moments and see the attendees coming in here. And then I'll introduce everybody. Great, so I think we've got quite a lot of people already here for, um, for the event tonight and um, I'll, I'll start just shortly. We've got a few more attendees just joining right now. So thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for joining us at the Frontline Club in its digital form uh, tonight uh, for this panel on freelancing and the future of news and the sort of freelance viewpoint on news gathering, uh, particularly in the context of the recent events in the world that we all find ourselves affected by. Great, so I can see we've got quite a lot of participants here now. So let me start uh, by thanking everybody again for coming and joining this Frontline Club event. Um, my name is Zoe Flood. I am a freelance journalist, as is everybody on this panel. And um, I have been freelancing for uh, 10 years as a journalist and filmmaker. And it's a great pleasure to be here tonight with such a, a wide, a, a incredibly experienced and talented panel of freelance journalists and filmmakers who are all going to be bringing such interesting perspectives to this discussion. And we look forward to hearing from you in the audience as well. Um, I'm hilariously listed as being in Devon, which is completely accurate and not normally where I'm based. I've been based in Nairobi for the last 10 years, reporting across sub-Saharan Africa, but I am currently in the southwest of England. Um, so not normally my sort of frontline location at all. Um, but uh, yeah, nice to, to be here and, and here for, uh, for pandemic reasons, uh, as many people's situations have been affected by that. Um, so let me just run through our fantastic panel for tonight. So the event is um, views from the front, you know, this is a freelance perspective. So first of all, let me introduce Elijah Kenyi, who's a Kenyan journalist and filmmaker. Um, his BBC Africa Eye documentary, The Bullet and the Virus, which he filmed and reported, co-directed earlier this year. Um, and I recommend it thoroughly to all of you. You can find it on YouTube. Um, it was recently shortlisted for the One World Media Coronavirus Reporting Award. Alija is also freelance for other international media, including Associated Press and Al Jazeera. And he also works with the investigative uh, team at Africa Uncensored as an investigative filmmaker. And Lija was born and raised in Mathari, which is one of Nairobi's poorest neighborhoods. And today he's coming from us where he's been out on assignment in Kisumu in Western Kenya. So thanks for, for tuning in from your, uh, from your current workplace, Lija. Uh, let you. me move to, uh, to Leila, Leila Milana Allen, who is a British Iranian freelance foreign correspondent. She's been based in Beirut, covering the wider Middle East for the past five years. She covered the recent Beirut explosion for TV, radio, and print, including for PBS NewsHour, France 24, BBC Radio, Monocle Magazine, and others. Leila has also covered um, Lebanon's uprising for NPR, and prior to that, she was reporting packages, short doc style films, news and feature stories across the Middle East and North Africa region, mostly for NBC, the BBC, and Al Jazeera, and prior to that was a staff filmmaker for The Economist. Um, back to the UK, so we've got a, 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 a panel coming from all across the world today, thanks to, thanks to this being the Digital Frontline Club. Um, Salam Rizek is an Emmy award-winning Syrian filmmaker currently based in London, who has reported extensively across the Middle East, including for the BBC, Guardian, Vice and AFP. Salam was a Rory Peck News Features finalist in 2015 for some really extraordinary work in Syria. And, is special, and his specialism has been reporting on Islamic groups. And finally, to Colombia. So 
We really are covering all the continents today, or most of them. Um, Monica Villamizar is an Emmy award-winning Colombian-American on-air reporter and producer. She recently produced the Showtime series, The Trade, season two of The Trade, which is about human trafficking and immigration and premiered at Sundance earlier this year. She currently works for clients including PBS NewsHour, Al Jazeera English, Vice and Telemundo. Monica was nominated for the prestigious One World Media Journalist of the Year in 2015. As well as covering the Arab Spring and the war against ISIS, she has covered the drug wars of, in Colombia and Mexico and the recent Ebola outbreak in Eastern Congo. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. Really great to have you here. And so excited to hear uh, your perspectives uh, from the front or from your home countries, wherever you may be based at this point, um, on, and, on your reporting experiences and also on the future of journalism and freelancers, journalism's role in that. So first of all, I wanted to start with a general question for all of you before we go into practical experiences and recent experiences. Um, aside from, you know, many of you have been freelancing for some time. Um, aside from wanting to continue freelancing because it's your job, because it's, it's what you do, why do you think that freelancing plays such an important part in the landscape of journalism internationally and why do you think that 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 freelance space should be preserved and protected what do you think is so important about it um perhaps you can start with with you monica because you're uh, on my <laughs> top sure. left there. well i think it's a great question and you know it's something that we all think about all the time i guess um we've seen and you know people listening are, are seeing that you know with the pandemic for instance what the newscast and everybody's tending to do is just to cover things remotely. And obviously it's probably easier to put, you know, people in the studio to discuss things and all of that and report on the news remotely. But I think that's, that's terrible. And that, you know, what we do as freelancers is basically go and do field reporting. And we, you know, go to places where people sometimes don't want to go because of various reasons or nobody is interested or people don't pay because it's risky and you just go there. And the fact that you can be on the ground reporting back what you're seeing, you know, with your eyes and what you're hearing with your ears and getting that perspective on the ground, I think is very important. It's more important now than ever, I think, especially because technology allows us to, you know, just, I don't know, send a drone and, you know, get some drone shots and have people in the studio commenting. But I think old school, you know, shoe leather reporting is very important. Fantastic, really important. Salam, perhaps I can go to you. Why do you think freelancers' voices are so important in the news well, landscape? Well, basically, I think sometimes, uh, we can uh, reach places uh, uh, and other people they cannot reach it and sometimes we can spend more time than people they have a staff job in channels or newspaper or we go for a place and stay like one or two years so we can understand the area more and be deeper in the story uh, that not mean the people they work in uh, stuff in channel, in channel or newspaper they cannot but uh, if you are reporting in news you have to produce every day a piece uh, but uh, for us especially if you uh, do the commentary or long piece you can take a little bit more time uh, and this good and bad in same time <laughs> So for this, I think uh, it is very important. Uh, and another thing, always we are, I think we can be more close to the people because not we have uh, office job and we can have uh, spend more time with people uh, and listen uh, for different places, uh, for different people, different backgrounds, uh, for a different story. I think that, but that not mean people, they have a staff job, they not do great job, but it is just different structure. Yes, yeah, so there's more sort of opportunity within the schedule and space to, to be able to do that. Alija, what do you think about that? What do you think is sort of important to you about the freelance voice? I think the, the, the best part of a freelance is the freedom. Because most of the time when you're doing a story, you don't have to ask anyone permission. You want to be the first one on the, on the scene and shoot whatever you get and to make sure it goes where it's supposed to be on time. But uh, most of the time you find if you are employed permanently, 
for you to ask for permission, especially when you're going to fill in violence, there are those procedures that you have to ask before you go to the field. But as a freelance, you find you live there, you have a good access to the story. And the moment, moment, and that's very important, especially when it comes to news, because most of the time you find people reporting on the aftermath, but most of the freelance get the actual, the action part, and that's the most important bit, especially to the news and also to the, the features and documentaries for real-time events. For real-time events, fantastic. And I think we can come back to some of the issues that that also raises around safety and security and risk. Um, that, that also are in, sort of in, involved um, if, if freelancers are finding themselves on the scene um, as, as events are playing out and not necessarily um, being governed by some of those uh, in-house rules. Um, and Leila, I mean, you've recently reported on a major international news event and, you know, that it was covered both by staffers and freelancers. Do you think that the freelancers in, in Beirut brought a different set of perspectives to, to that, to, to the terrible explosion there? I do think so. And I think actually um, this, you know, this was one of obviously the most major news stories this year and partly because of the pandemic and the fact that being able to travel at a moment's notice now for staffers based in London or Paris or New York is a slightly different situation. We really saw the level to which, you know, Beirut, which has such a reinforced uh, long-standing freelance community really stepped up to the plate and covered this uh, you know, particularly in the, in the early days of it, um, before, you know, other teams got out and, uh, what both Alicia and Salem were saying there about, you know, there's, there's what freelancers can do in terms of getting there immediately because they are based in these places. They are able to react incredibly quickly and they're not, uh, the stories are not dictated by whichever company they work for and the interests of that audience. A freelancer can decide what they think is important, start doing work and then decide who it should go to, which is a real asset rather than having to kind of fit into whatever uh, schedule any news organization might have. But then also that long haul, you know, of really being able to give the time. And obviously, as we all know, uh, as freelancers, that often means you end up working for passion rather than money. Uh, but, you know, being able to, again, not have your schedule dictated and really give the story the time that you think it needs. Uh, and even the basic thing of not of living a very different style of life, I think, uh, you know, particularly those of us who kind of base ourselves somewhere and you're not working with a Western company, you're not uh, working within any particular, you know, organization. And so the, I feel that the stories you're telling do often what you choose to do isn't dictated by the news agenda. So obviously the, the explosion was one thing, but, but many of the stories that you'll see that came out of that and other news events that are told later that really have that richness of experience and on the ground understanding of an area and that take the time to build up those relationships uh, and tell the kind of longer lasting impacts of different news events. Those come from freelancers who both have that engagement and have the time uh, to be able to commit to it. And I think that's a really rich aspect, that storytelling of freelance, freelance journalism that's so important. And that's a really interesting point that you, that you raised there, Leila, which I um, will sort of use to pivot into the next question, question I have for you guys, is that in the sort of sense of, um, in the context, the current context of, of the pandemic and the limitations on travel, there have been opportunities that have have been available to uh, locally based, or I'd not say locally based, but freelancers who are based in a particular region, in a particular city, or freelancers who are from that country or community to provide that news, that coverage, that access, that information, that reporting, that footage, when others have been unable to travel. And um, I wanted to sort of go to Elijah here on this on this point. I mean, you're you're based, born born, bred, raised in 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 Nairobi. You know, how have you found the context of the pandemic in terms of opening up opportunities? There is obviously quite a large journalist uh, community in Nairobi, but have you found that the the sort of uh, restrictions on travel have opened up opportunities for you individually as a freelancer? Fortunately, I think Ali just just frozen as I ask him a question. Yeah, uh, I, I will, oh, you're back. I, I will relate to the bullet and the virus because some of the stories that I've done are always action. And when the pandemic started, nothing was happening in the slum. And I wanted to tell the story from the slum. And the first, some of the first stories that I started with 
were just uh, uh, the community workers, what they were doing about the pandemic, because everyone else was focusing on the government side of the story, on their preparation. But in the slum, there was also these social workers and the youth groups trying to do something within the community, trying to, to set up a situation where in case the, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, breaks out in the slum, what next? And this gave me an opportunity to just highlight the, the issue at a, at a local level, but there was another issue which we could not highlight at the, at the local level. And this was Sorry, police brutality. There are some stories, stories to be heard internationally. Then this was the only opportunity that I could have used to, to highlight the effect and the stories that were happening. When, when a young guy was killed uh, in, the, in the slum, I just received a call and I was told, uh, someone has been killed. There is no any media houses there. Can you come and highlight this story? This is not the first case. This was not the second case. There were these cases, but no one was highlighting. And to me, it was a matter of documenting all that and knowing the right time on how to bring it out and also to make it more international. So I had to, to, to plan how to pass the message locally and how to package whatever I have for a bigger story. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up on that quickly, Elijah, did you, um, I mean, you, you, the, 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 the incidents that you document in that film are in the community that you grew up in, that you were, that you were raised in, that you live in. Do you think it would have been as possible for um, international crews to come in and tell those stories in the way that you told them? Actually, most of the stories that were happening and the, 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 the most of the footage that was aired on the bullet on the virus did not air anyone else. They were all exclusive because I, most of the time I was the first one on the scene. And this gave me an advantage whereby I needed to react and also to plan on what to use locally and what to use at that moment and what to use for a bigger piece. So I had to the scene because most of the time people look at you and they see you as a voice of that society. They want to see their stories on national TV. They want to see their story being aired. But when you get to the scene, there are a lot of things that happens. So it's up to you to focus and plan accordingly to be able to bring the message out. But most of the time you'll find all the international will come in while I'm going out. I already have action and then you meet people who are coming to the scene when the action is already done. So they come to do the aftermath, we already have the action. Interesting, thanks Alicia. Salam, just coming back to sort of the question of uh, challenges. I mean, this was an opportunity that Alija had in terms of the pandemic that he could, uh, could tell some stories that uh, were available locally to him. How has it been for you as an experience as a freelancer in terms of the travel restrictions and how do you hope that will change in the near future? Well, for me personally, I think it was a bit uh, hard. Like I have a couple of projects been stopped uh, because you cannot travel and some stories, uh, I think it is difficult. I cannot really hire any uh, any cameraman or something because some of them uh, <clears throat> maybe after uh, after finish filming can be a risk for local journalists to stay where where I have to do uh, do it and for this uh, like being cancelled and another thing uh, budget issue uh, at the moment I think that like all of us we know we are not living in the best time of media for many reasons, especially this year of coronavirus. But I think it is a great opportunity uh, this year for local journalists uh, reporting uh, stories. Nobody can report it and get more opportunity. Uh, and uh, we, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, getting more opportunity for those people living uh, local, uh, those uh, uh, local journalists uh, to gather more stories and uh, uh, and having this opportunity. I think it uh, it is for that side. It is great. It's really great. 
And um, Monica, how have you managed to navigate the past six months in terms of the pandemic and, and the sort of restrictions on travel when your sort of previous uh, life, lifestyle was very mobile? How have you, how have you managed that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I think I've gone through many stages with, you know, as the pandemic sort of drags on and on. At the beginning, I really thought to myself as, you know, I sort of panicked for a moment and said, you know, if I don't work on anything COVID related, that's it. You know, that's, there's nothing, there's not going to be any work this year or something. So I immediately, um, and was very lucky because I'm based in Washington, DC. So I was lucky to be part of a of a project, a documentary um, on COVID and traveling to New York where, you know, it was really the epicenter of the world in terms of COVID at the time was really easy for me to do, but it involved, you know, maybe um, covering something that I just never thought I was going to cover in depth. It, so it's, it's a little bit like the freelancer's dilemma where you're like, you say yes to everything because you basically want to work, you know, you're living a lot in the present. Um, so I worked on that um, inside a hospital. It was very hard. And then uh, everything, as you guys know, I mean, sort of started happening in the U.S. where I'm based. So I was very lucky to have like the news constantly in, you know, outside my house. There was um, very important, uh, you know, historic, you know, uh, movement of protest, uh, you know, African-American, Black Lives Matter. And we cover that. And uh, yeah, it's been, you know, I think we're good, freelancers are good at adapting, you know, and sort of working with what we have. But I definitely miss those days of like a foreign correspondent where you go, you know, to Africa or Latin America, you know, and you have sort, sort of like no limits. You just go and, you know, what's difficult is getting the journalistic access. Now, what's almost like more difficult is doing the logistics, you know, and then you have to deal with the journalism part of it. So um, it's been very challenging. And so sort of to follow on on the logistics question, I mean, that has seems to have really, really affected the industry in its entirety, of course, but particularly freelancers. I mean, would you guys agree that the budgets available for freelancers, and particularly for freelance travel, have been squeezed? I mean, it seems to me that from my experience and from talking to a lot of friends in the industry that um, so many media budgets are being very tightly squeezed and then you know, the bits that are obvious to cut are things like freelance travel and staffers are being prior prioritized. I mean, is that something that you guys are seeing? Um, Salam, perhaps if you... Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think this year, first of all, we have COVID and now also we have uh, this the year for American elections. So uh, I'm not think like whatever, the, at least uh, at least you have very huge story and even though it's really difficult for any editor to send you any place. So what uh, will have left uh, the coronavirus story and most of the channels are local, uh, like uh, you will do local news and most of the time they, uh, they are already have it. Uh, the local stuff they, uh, to covering these stories. And one for the thing I think is sometimes it's, bit hard when you do some good story and you finish it and you want to doing like the basic story basically sometimes it's really difficult to uh getting the basic job because everybody wants you to give him the best story and sometimes not always you can do that hmm. absolutely and so on that note, I mean, Monica mentioned it as well that, you know, freelance journalists, we, we're all quite used to having to be to adapt and yeah. to sort of respond to the circumstances. And I've certainly seen that a lot among a lot of friends and um, in my own life as well. I mean, what would you say if you were sort of advising young uh, freelancers who are coming into the space as to how to sort of build a package of work that allows you to diversify and protect against these periods of um i guess less less busy times or when you know budgets are tight um i mean leila you've had you've had a busy time sort of unusually because of the events that have happened in beirut but uh in in your sort of normal life do you have other strings to your bow that help you to yes to manage I've, the patches? I've had a very odd year uh because i remember it's funny hearing salam say that about the elections and thinking you know i remember at the beginning of this year all of us saying right you know, the US elections are coming up. So if we want Middle East stories to get out there, we've basically got seven months and then no one's going to be interested anymore. And obviously the year did not turn out that way. And it's very strange. I haven't, you know, for those of us who are used to jumping on a plane every five minutes, I haven't traveled since last December. 
for nearly a year now. And, but of course, the last 11 months in Lebanon have been such, previous to that, I was mostly based here to cover the region and I would push the Lebanon stories, but they would never really come through because uh, most people weren't as interested as they were in the other countries I was covering. And this year, frankly, I don't think I would have left Lebanon. I would have struggled to go anywhere, uh, even if I had been able to COVID wise, because it's been such a crazy news year, you know, event after event. So I've kind of been protected from the COVID impact uh, in that way. Certainly there's been a huge impact uh, on budgets, as you say, particularly sort of travel budgets and just expenses in general. I think uh, for me, Certainly, you know, I, I, I have kind of created a, a situation where I have the main things I do. I'm, you know, I'm primarily a television journalist, uh, but I write, I do a lot of radio. Uh, and so having those different areas means that, you know, you can, the reality is we all have to do kind of more work for less pay this year, whenever we can find it. Uh, but being able to do all those different things really does help, uh, particularly when, you know, stories. So if you're in a situation where, for instance, it became so difficult to do certain sorts of things uh, on TV for the first few weeks of COVID because everyone was panicking and we were basically trapped. I mean, I remember I was, I was doing lives from my bedroom because they didn't want us to go out and everyone thought this would last a couple of weeks. And I, and, uh, you know, I sort of say, well, you know, from what I can see online, you know, this is what's happening outside. And then, you know, gradually people started to change. But at that time, that meant if you couldn't get in somewhere, then maybe it would work better for a print story. Uh, you know, if all you could take in was a recorder because people were worried about equipment, you could do a radio story. So having all that kind of uh, technical knowledge and the context of those editors meant that I really was able to pick what medium the story worked best for. And the same thing happened with the explosion, you know, that it was often about what you could access, when you could get it and what, what were the best elements of what you'd found and what kind of medium they'd work best in. So I definitely say trying to get yourself a stable of technical skills and a wide variety of editors that you have relationships with you know, I went back to editors who I haven't worked with for years, uh, who were suddenly, you know, super interested again, um, which meant that I had a lot of freedom to kind of, and I've actually really enjoyed this period of, of uh, massively diversifying my portfolio again, uh, in terms of things I'm working on. But the other thing I would say, just in terms of, you know, being able to be adaptable as we have to be, is, is my advice to a young freelancer would always be get up and go somewhere and base yourself self there. And as I say, you know, for of the last five years that I've been here, for certainly the first three, I wasn't covering Lebanon that extensively, but I was covering it extensively myself and I was really rooting myself here. And that meant that when all of this happened, I became one of the go-to people here for you know, editors around the world would hear about me, would know about me and would be directed towards me. So being able to make something your patch, uh, even if at the time it's not necessarily and develop those relationships, have the contacts, have the knowledge, is something that really at some point when your chance comes uh, is going to be something that will really help you um, will mean you can suddenly kind of work with, with all sorts of people uh, because you were sort of in the right place at the right time whereas if you jump around too much you may strike lucky but often you won't. Great thanks Leila and Alija I mean you've you've come into freelancing by a different route rather than traveling somewhere and going to base yourself somewhere like Leila has done and I also did myself um, how 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 have you found that sort of early years of your early years of your freelance career? What did you do to make sure that you could make a living as well as do the work that you wanted to do? Were you doing a sort of multitude of things at the same time? I uh, I had to balance. For me, yeah. the first contact that I got and I received it was from Associated Press. And what I used to do is that I'll make sure whatever I get, because Associated Press was my, like, uh, the first international company that I produced to for the news. Every time I'll get something, I'll make sure the local TV gets what they, they, they want. And it was a specific company. So at first it was NTV. And then the next thing, I'll take my footage to Associated Press. And I used to concentrate on just those two. So I didn't have to, to struggle too much on where to take my footage and where not to, because I knew locally my, my footage will go to NTV, but at the same time internationally have Associated Press. So anyone who will come along to ask for footage, I'll first have to decide, is this the right idea? Is this the right way to do? But eventually we started doing investigative for Africa and censored. So I'll gauge on which footage that goes and which I will keep for further investigating, because some of the footage that we receive on the scene 
you end up thinking about what you just did. What else can you go back and do it even further? Like get a sequence that you can even investigate and try to do a bigger story out of it. And one of the there was this time where everyone was protesting and that happened to be yeah go further apart from that so most of the footage I'll get which one is going as a news piece and which part is going to be an investigative piece so I'll plan that all by myself but at the same time every time I'll get the footage I'll be in a position to say this will go as a news piece this will go as a news piece and this one I can keep it for future documentary and also as an investigative story so I'll just plan between uh, all along I had another interest coming in for local TV which was KTN and I will also provide them with the footage but most of the footage that I will give it to them it was more exclusive so they will always call me when I'm in the scene and I'll advise them to also send their crew by the time they come I leave I give them the, the exclusive part and they also get the aftermath but at the same time I have my footage for Associated Press and I have another footage for African censored. So it's only managing the contacts that you have and you satisfy them and you plan according to your wish list. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, it sounds to me, it's quite similar to what Leila was saying as well. So you're both diversifying your skills on, in one sense, uh, Leila was saying in terms of medium, but also the material that you're producing, you're thinking about how that it can be repackaged for news, how it can be repackaged for features, investigations, and, and making sort of, I guess, strategic and business decisions as well as editorial decisions about yeah, and, those. And, and also to, to mention something that uh, just came out from the, the bullet and the virus is that the BBC also are trying to change the investigative style of doing things. So when the pandemic started, it was more unique for me to voice because for, for the last 13 years, I've just been a filmmaker. I've never voiced. That was my first time to voice that story. And it's because at first they approached me to voice it and I said no. I can't voice. I've never voiced. No, that's not what but, you do. But actually, yeah, you know what I do. I just feel him. So they called me because I had said no on the email, and it was back and forth. And they eventually called me and told me, "Listen, am I talking to you in Swahili or English? English. You have to voice this thing. This is your story. You have to tell it as it is." And that gave me courage. So for any freelance, young freelance out there, they should never be scared of anything ahead of them. And if you believe in again. you to do it, and he's there. So, slightly lost you there at the end, Alicia, but that it sounded like you were just continuing your encouragement of uh, for young freelancers to, uh, to, to, to to try their hand at different skills, even if they might not be sure or confident of it uh, when they start out. Um, Salam, I mean, does that speak to you as well from when you started out? I know that you're working at a very high level now, but when you first started freelancing... No, like I start, I start translation, like I'm not start yeah. very high level, like I think... Uh, I think especially if you are a starter, do whatever you can do until you reach where, where your dream. And even when you reach your dream, you, you have to, uh, you not have to stake to say, for example, if you do documentary, you just say, oh, I do documentary, I'm not doing news because in the end of the day, you, you have to pay your bills. And, if you, uh, and not always you can do uh, documentary. If you cannot do documentary today, do news, do uh, radio, like uh, Leila, what she was mentioned, uh, but different uh, different uh, tools and different uh, skills have and uh, build a good relationship with the editors. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, build a good relationship with the editors. And another thing, Mostly like Leila, what she was mentioned, and uh, Monica before. To uh, we we are as a freelancer, we are always traveling and stay in some place. But I think it's most important thing before anybody uh, traveling for any new place to have a, a security plan uh, for safety, uh, safety. And especially if you are going to war zone, and with my experience. Uh, 
many times, especially with young freelancer. Uh, a lot of that time they are, they have uh, big ambitions and they became really a rush without really thinking about the risk. I think the most important thing, if you are in that position to be ask uh, the freelancer older than you and uh, <clears throat> and uh, always if you are in war zone or uh, uh, some area you will find around some security advise, uh, advisor or you can always call, uh, call Roy Baker frontline to take some advice for uh, some security advisor or uh, talk with many people who before to go a dangerous place because it is very important and it is not just important for any freelancer it's important for all of us because when some uh, free any freelancer been injured that affect everybody mm, absolutely and i think that leads on really really sort of neatly to talking about safety and security both sort of in in normal times as freelancers where security and safety are um of great concern and also as, as you said, Salam, that like, you know, young sort of enthusiastic freelancers who want to prove themselves and want to get things done may uh, rush a bit or not necessarily take the time and also may not be given the time by clients, which is something that I think is really important for also more established freelancers. I feel sometimes that I want to push back a bit on clients and say, or editors and say, look, you know, make sure that you spend time um, I know you really want to get this done and you have this 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 hard deadline that's been made up by somebody but you know like give it some give it a chance for the people to work out what they're doing and take their time um to, to sort of make a clear clear safety plan um and make sure they're not putting themselves at risk through desire to 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 sort of get a byline or get their get you know get get a particular job i mean monica does that resonate with you and and sort of how also has that changed under in sort of times of covid because of the uh, particular types of risks that are now um, the sort of extra risks that are there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think you know with COVID and um, virus, uh, you know, it, it I think it's going to be a, like another front line, or it is already. This is the new conflict reporting. I believe so. I mean, I was telling you previously that I I went to Africa to cover uh, the Ebola outbreak last year in Congo DRC. It's, it's a different kind of risk because uh, you don't see it. And it's something that I was really not used to. Um, you know, when you go to a war zone or you go meet a drug trafficker, you kind of, you know, there's a lot of things that you can sense about where to go and where not to. Like you follow your instincts in a way, but with, you know, with these threats, I think things are, are changing a whole lot for us. And I think for me personally, I think I took a lot of risks and I was exposed to COVID, like really exposed at the beginning. And now I don't want to be as exposed because we find out, as we find out more and more about this virus, we know that it's perhaps, you know, that it has, I don't know, different con like health consequences and stuff. So, um, you know, it's, it's been really hard personally too, because you think about other people you can affect, your parents, you know, who may get a lot sicker, et cetera. So a lot of things sort of came into play for me um, with COVID, but I do think, you know, kind of navigating the safety around it is gonna be crucial because it is a big story and it's here, you know, to stay for at least for the next months, I, I think. I mean, that's at least how I read it. I don't know what my other colleagues think about this. And just to follow up on your point, I mean, I know you're working on a longer term project, but do you think that um, there is a, a sort of, difference between how maybe news outlets are treating staffers and freelancers or are they just tending to use staffers more because they're covered by insurance they're covered by in-house protocol i mean is that something that's also going to make the freelance workspace harder um, in terms of the sort of covid precautions and and so on right i i do agree i think it is because Basically, the more you're exposed, like the, the closer you want to get to the story, if it's COVID, uh, you're going to be exposed, you know, to the virus in different ways. If you're going to a medical setting, obviously you're much more exposed, but if you're talking to patients or people who are recovering, et cetera. So one crucial thing is that you need to be provided personal protective equipment, and that is, you know, hard to come by if you're a freelance, and you need to be replacing it, and you need to, to know how to put it on and how to take it off in order to be doing your job safely. And also what you said is absolutely true. I mean, if you live in the US like I do, their health system 
is um, very bad for freelancers like myself. So if I get sick with COVID and if I get really sick, then my family could go bankrupt. I mean, and that, uh, those are real issues that people are having you know, in the United States, freelancers are having. If you cover a story there and your health is jeopardized, um, you know, there is no public you know, free healthcare in America and obviously in other places too. So you really have to think about the risk versus the reward, I think. Absolutely. And there are so many, as you say, in the US, but, you know, I think immediately someone like Kenya, for example, Elijah, I'll come to you on this. But before I come to you, Elijah, I just want to mention to the audience that uh, please, there's a and a box. And if you want to sort of drop any questions in there, I have a couple which I've seen and I will be um, asking to the panel shortly. But uh, just carrying on on the safety, uh, safety track, Elijah, when you made the uh, bullet in the virus film, you were exposed to a COVID positive patient. Um, and uh, you, you, that is shown at the end of the film. How did that feel to you? I mean, it was quite early on in the days of the virus. You're, you're in a country where there, there were still not that many positive cases. You know, were you nervous? How did you manage that situation personally in terms of your own isolation and, and sort of coming back to what Monica was saying, obviously there are you know, potential medical costs involved, which are very nerve wracking for freelancers. Um, were you sort of backed up there? By your uh, by your commissioner, and and similarly, you know, did you have to make any plans to self isolate that were difficult? You know, were you able to do that in your own home, or did you have to do something else? Because that's another cost, which I've also heard other freelancers talk about, is that they've had to sort of self isolate or quarantine for two weeks after exposure, and and you know, how do you do that if you're not on a staff salary? Yeah. For, for this story, I, I, maybe I can explain by saying that I was lucky to be commissioned by BBC to do this story. And the reason why I was lucky is because there was proper plan on how to do a, a, a hospital sequence. And even mm -hmm. before that, personally, I did not plan for any shoot inside a hospital. But along the shoot, when I was filming, there was a time that we realized we needed a certain sequence. And when I went home and explained that Next week, I'm going to fill him in a hospital. Saying this to my wife, she was, she was not agreeing because this was something that we had not planned to do, but now it's here, it's on our face and we needed to get that, but we didn't ex think that I was going to be exposed. So before we started filming, uh, we had to sit down with the commission and the producer and the directors who were assisting me. And we had to plan on the way forward. Even before I started going to the clinic, I had to move out and stay in a hotel. And the moment I was staying there and filming, the moment we filmed a certain case, which looked like it was going to be a COVID, I had to move from that hotel to another apartment where I will go and isolate for 14 days and at 12, as well do the test. So what I did was I had to move from that hotel. I had to book an extra day because I had to go do the test. So the room had to stay locked for another like a day or two without anyone going inside to keep everyone safe. And then I had to move to another room where I went and I isolated alone and I did the test and luckily I was lucky and that's how I survived. But as a freelance, it could have been very difficult to do all those things because I stayed there for three days and after being exposed, I had to book that room for another two days to be free 24 hours without anyone so that I could be moved to another place. So that could have been very difficult for me to do that as a freelance. So I was lucky on that point. And that's why it's so difficult also for freelance to get those hard access when it comes to certain dangers like this pandemic right now. No, no, no freelance will ever want to go and fill him in inside a hospital to be able to get these kind of shots because you know, after that, where are you going? unless you have good plans and you're staying alone. But at the same time, how are you interacting? Where are you staying? All these things mattered to me before I made a decision that I would go and film this. So I had to move away from my family. And at first we had to tell my daughters I had traveled because I didn't want them to be scared. So we told them I have moved to a different town to film, but at the same time I knew what I was doing and my wife was a lot. And I had to explain before the story came out to my family, my daughters, what was happening so that when we, they, we watch the story out together, they'll be able to understand and not to hear from anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and do you think that would have been something that would have been possible, as you say, would have been very difficult to do 
were you working on your own um, without the backup of a, of, of a media organization the size of the BBC? That will be a challenge, being honest, that I won't push myself to that extent where I want to go and get that certain shot. There are things as a freelance that you have to make a decision on what to do. And this is, this is the time whereby we have to gauge on what you want to do and the risk ahead of it. So there are things that I can do and there are things that I can do. I could not have... We've lost Alicia slightly there. Yeah. Oh, we just lost you, but that's, that, that sounds great. Um, maybe I can just come to Salam from that and then, and then on to Leila. Um, Salam, I mean, you've done a lot of uh, high risk, high risk work. Um, you know, as sort of look to returning back to filming, are you concerned about the management of risk in terms of COVID or will you just be applying your normal risk assessments to the process of? No, I, uh, the risk assessment, I think uh, last week I did done one and it's completely different than normal risk assessment, especially for COVID. Another thing like uh, what uh, uh, Monica and uh, <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ella, uh, uh, was they was mentioned is completely different the plan. And then another thing I want to mention, for example, uh, for insurance, if you are uh, going for country, like for example, here in UK, there are certain for countries. You can, if you come back from it, you have to quarantine for two weeks. But if you are if you are going there to work or filming, the insurance company they not governing you if you get sick in that country that means you will pay uh, your uh, your hospital and everything there and it probably will be like uh, very very expensive and this another thing uh, we have to be aware of, uh, from it and like what uh, monica mentioned it is really scary it's not a front line or something it is something we cannot see it so and the only thing we are can do uh, do it. Uh, I think if you not have assignment with uh, with some uh, media and uh, you have a, a good uh, high risk team, I cannot say don't do it because in the end I know there's a lot of freelancer and they have to work. But at least try to get how much information to do uh, to avoid uh, the risk uh, for the virus because it is way high risk than any uh, risk we are in normal faces. It is not a sniper, it is not a, uh, <laughs> anything like this, it's something we cannot see. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think on that note there is also quite a lot of useful information that has come out from some of the journalist support um, organizations, media support organizations, freelance support organizations about the kind of uh, risk assessments or protocol around COVID reporting. And I think also, um, you know, expectations or requests or demands that you can make of a media organization that's asking you to report in these conditions as a freelancer, you know, things that you can ask for. Um, yeah, sorry to uh, uh, forget this. Uh, actually, yeah, I think uh, Roy Becker at France Klein, always they uh, feed us uh, in this uh, information and I think it's really useful uh, in general. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if there are any freelancers uh, listening to this uh, specifically who are looking at, at their own sort of reporting circumstances, there are a lot of really good uh, pieces of uh, resources out there that you can look into in terms of risk assessments and sort of safety protocols. And, and I think certainly, um, particularly with organizations like ACOS Alliance, Frontline Freelance Register, that are around, they're all there to support freelancers in asking and demanding their rights um, in terms of safety, physical security, um, and so on. And sort of coming on from that point, um, Leila, I mean, perhaps you could, you uh, have your own recent experiences of, uh, your own um, uh, very traumatic experience of the Beirut blast, which was so traumatic for everybody who was there. But I mean, you personally suffered physical injuries as well. I mean, how has that been to um, manage as a freelancer to sort of continue reporting whilst also dealing with physical injuries and also the destruction of your own home, home 
you're at home, your sort of normal lifestyle. I mean, how have you managed that? And, and what are the things that you've learned from that and that you'd be willing, willing to share? Yeah, I am, you know, obviously, as we all do, my, my career has been one of working in dangerous places, but you usually are going into it knowing there's danger. And that perhaps is one of the things about COVID now, you know, that suddenly everywhere is dangerous. Um, but this, I've been very lucky and I, and I haven't been injured in the field before. And this was very different uh, because my house exploded, all our houses exploded. And that's something you're, you know, you're not prepared for. Uh, so yes, my apartment exploded. I was, I was in the apartment um, and we sort of didn't realize how badly injured I was till a bit later because it was all so chaotic. And I was, uh, I sort of, you know, came running out and we were all trying to, you know, and this is where my field training, I never thought that I'd be getting out my, my field gear in my street and, you know, using uh, our first aid kits on, on our neighbors. Um, but that's, you know, what happened to us. Uh, and I, work started immediately. You know, my phone rang three minutes later and I was working for 50 hours straight Oh, without a break and, and even, you know, I was doing lives from the hospital. And at the beginning, they just sort of stitched me up. My feet were shredded and I, and I had some lung problems. Um, and over the next few weeks, it started to come out how badly injured I was. So first, a few days later, um, I stopped breathing and I had to be taken back to the hospital. And we discovered that I had lung damage um, from the debris, which had been made worse by the fact that I had nowhere to go. So we slept in our, at our neighbors on his sofa for a few days, my flatmate and I. Uh, but we couldn't afford to go anywhere else. And my company wouldn't help me at all, the company that I was mainly working for. So I'd been a contracted correspondent for a, for a company uh, for a few years and they didn't step up to help at all. They refused to help with any kind of, you know, uh, safe accommodation uh, with my other costs while having me work uh, consistently sort of 24 seven. I was obviously working for a lot of other people uh, for two reasons. Firstly, because, you know, I was there on the scene and it was important to cover the story and also because I had no other choice uh, you know, I, the extent of work that I did was also, you know, from a financial point of view, because this was all going to be so expensive. And then after that, so I was sort of working on um, the injured legs for about three weeks. And when the stitches came out of my wounds, uh, we then discovered that injuries had been missed and two of the tendons inside one of my feet had been severed in the explosion. Um, and that sort of hadn't been found. So the pain that I'd been in, they hadn't realized what it was from. Uh, and the other foot was was um, sort of still has glass growing out of it now is something which is something that a lot of us have experienced uh, these kind of smaller injuries that come later and so dealing with all of that while working and then not having any support uh, really taught me a lot I think you know I've very much always been somebody I started out in a staff job unlike many other freelancers and I made the decision after five years in that staff job which was a great staff job I was a filmmaker for The Economist traveling all over the place but I really wanted to go up and do my own stories um, and I've always since then worked very much you know for passion essentially as long as I can live as long as I can feed myself that's fine and this really taught me that you know you have to look after yourself I have really changed my tune it's made me a lot more hard-nosed about things uh, I've resigned from that company and I refuse to work for them anymore after they behaved and it showed me you know there's that expression uh, if people tell you who they are believe them right and they this company had behaved badly for years but because I liked working with them editorially I carried on whereas other companies some of whom I was working with for the first time stepped up and offered to help me one company I was making my first ever film from the, the first week and they put me up in a hotel uh, you know for the first week that I was working them so really kind of gauging who your editors are what kind of company they are whether they're the kind of people you want to be working with in dangerous scenarios and you get that you know feeling from somebody early on in a working relationship also now you know i'm creating a nest egg for myself i'm really quite determined now to you know i'm looking at much safer insurance options than what i had before uh, making sure that i'm going to have some sort of safety buffer so i'm never in the situation again i still don't have a house i'm very lucky that i have an amazing community here and i've been bumping from place to place i'm still in a cast so i'm still working on crutches and i haven't really you know, been able to take time off um but so it's yeah it's really taught me a lot about the, the fact that you know the only risk isn't getting blown up in the field you know, when you go into a war zone, there are certain protections you have to take and you take those, but you are going in and make, taking calculated risks. Whereas actually there are so many other things that can happen to you when you live this life that is quite unstable. Um, and yet yeah, it's, it's, it's taught me that I need to take more precautions um, and be a little bit less willing to do anything for the story. Because in the end, unless I know that I have the protections there, uh, because in the end, you know, I've only got one body and my, my body not working properly over the last two months while I've been reporting has really 
shown me how important my health and security is to being able to do my job effectively. Thanks, Leila. I mean, that's a, it's a very, um, very traumatic experience that you've been through and glad to hear that you're on the mend. Um, but I, you know, it's very, uh, I think sharing those lessons is very important to, 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 to so many of us. And I think uh, there are many of us who in different ways have taken risks or um, sort of not cut corners, but, you know, just sort of done things a little on the edge, perhaps, <laughs> around insurance, around protection, around, you know, sort of matters like that, which I think, especially when you're starting out, um, it's, it's there are kind of, the rationalization for that is always there. Um, and I think that's sort of, you know, it, it, I was talking to a couple of you earlier about the fact that, you know, often um, in sort of the freelance safety space, there's quite a lot of focus on war zone reporting, on the safety of freelancers in war zones, something that I've always, um, being quite vocal about is 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 car accidents. Uh, you know, I've known people have serious car accidents in Africa where I've been working, and I think it's often something that it may not happen when you're on assignment. It may happen when you're in a particular part of the world where perhaps road safety is of a particular standard or a different standard or um, something that you you might need to consider. And I do think that sort of um, those kind of non typical risks i mean obviously your experience in beirut is completely you know out of the ordinary in <laughs> global history but um you know these 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 incidents can happen that that, that we, we 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 don't necessarily predict or, or prepare for and i think that sort of comes on to, to sort of another question that i have for, for, for all of you guys and again to the audience if you've got questions please pop them in the q a got one or two that i'll just add in shortly um but following on from that i mean and we and, and monica you briefly mentioned it but uh I'd like to ask all of you, you know, we're talking about freelancing um, on, front, on the front line or from the front line, you know, what do you, how do you define the front line or front lines now in our world? I mean, are they the typical um, war zone front lines, military front lines, um, insurgent front lines, or, or you know, is that, is that a definition that, that is expanding and is that something that's important to, to consider in the news landscape? Monica, perhaps I'll go back to you for this one first. Yeah, thanks. So I, I mean, I, I agree 100%. I think the definition of front lines that we used to have, have really changed, you know, in a matter of maybe a couple of years, even. Um, I remember going to Mexico and Honduras and, you know, covering a lot of crime and drug trafficking, you know, activities, etc. And, you know, international newscasts would be like, but, you know, that's not a war zone. But, you know, sometimes it was more dangerous. And, you know, Mexico is one of the countries, for instance, where I think it's the highest number of journalists killed in the world right now. And it has been for the past years. So there is a little bit, um, I do think we need to expand the definition, front lines. It's more like hostile environments, I would say, where you're going somewhere and you're at risk the whole time. I think climate change is really important to keep in mind. I think it's going to generate, like the fires we're seeing right now in the US, you know, situations where the weather is very extreme and you have to be prepared. And it's going to present a lot of challenges safety-wise for journalists as well. And um, like I mentioned, viruses, biological threats, that's gonna be, I think, because of wildlife, you know, traffic and, and deforestation, so many things. I think that's gonna be with us, you know, for the next years in some form or another. So I think, you know, we as like frontline journalists, we specialize in going somewhere, um, trying to be as safe as possible, but going to places where it's very challenging uh, to get the news from because it's hostile to us. And I think, you know, we should, keep that in mind and, you know, defining that a hostile area is not necessarily where, you know, people are shooting each other and, you know, bombs are falling everywhere or these kind of things. Salam, what do you think about that? What do you think well, where the front lines lie in our world now? Well, I think I completely agree with uh, Monica. And I think like what she mentioned, sometimes uh, places like Honduras or uh, Mexico is way dangerous than really front line in the end of the day. If you are in war zone, you know where's the line and where where the front line between uh, places like where have a lot of uh, like crime and organized crime, you really don't know where the, uh, where the uh, dangerous came from where. And uh, 
uh, how, what she was mentioned actually i before uh, i think after 2005 baghdad was is in, in a way there is the american and different kind of militia in the street you don't know the uh, the risk uh, coming from where and uh, yeah it was war zone but also you it is not the war zone the problem the problem behind the sorry the behind the front line uh, the uh, organized gr uh, uh, group and the kidnapping and all this and also uh, not uh, not to mention now uh, the in, uh, coronavirus and the new uh, a new issue like I think people covering the hospital it is maybe it's more dangerous than actual front line because the, in the front line, we know we are going, and if you get injured, we just, you get injured, you not affect your parents or your wife or your girlfriend between now. If you get affect, uh, if you uh, get uh, the virus, you will affect a lot of people uh, without you noticed. And like, I cannot add more uh, what Monica she was saying, but I'm completely agree with her. And Alija, I mean, you looking at the reporting you've done, say in Mathare, in your own community. I mean, um, you've done quite a lot of work on police brutality. Um, you know, the the Kenyan police are not necessarily a very predictable force, in my experience. And 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 do you think that sort of the the threats from um, I guess entity, unpredictable entities or working also in your own community. I mean, how have you found your own risk and security in those environments? How have you, have you, have you felt about your own safety and well-being doing the kind of stories you've been doing? I think uh, most of the time before I go to the field, I, I normally have to gauge the situation. Which side am I going to enter? Depending on the community or the place where there is chaos. So it could be gangs fighting each other then I'll have to decide where am I going to stand? Am I going to which side? Because most of the time with the police, you can predict. You might move on from one side of the police to the crowd, or you can come from, because it's always dangerous to come from the crowd side. But you always find yourself in between the situation, and it's up to you to gauge. So for me, it all depends on the situation on the ground, and then I have to gauge where my safety is first before I even start filming. And most of the time, when I, when I go to the field, I, I always make sure the fixer that I have is someone that I can depend on because I am not, I'm not a genius. I don't know everywhere. And most of the fixers, they are, they are the ones also who help us as free, freelance journalists also to be able to reach where we get to. And there are places where you reach, you want to go to an extra mile. And if they agree on that point for me to move, that's where I make the move. But if they say no, I have to listen to them. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily about my own decision, but it's again also the to most of the time. Even before I make any move, I make sure that I know which side I'm going to come from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this is, I mean, this is, you're also saying this about community of the you're very familiar with. I mean, so you're saying that you're also treating them with the kind of level of um, care that you might do in those kind of dangerous environments as a, as a front line somewhere, you know, outside of Kenya or elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been to, to Mandera, the border between Kenya and Somali, and this is a place Well, this is where you get to, and, the, and you have to listen. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. So there are places, that I think, as Monica said, the definition of frontline has uh, completely changed from what we used to know before and right now. And it's because of all the challenges that we are facing in the world. They are all coming in a different way. We used to know uh, Frontline as a place where they are just army and militias fighting. But right now, everything has uh, completely changed. Mm -hmm. And so, Leila, coming around to you, I mean, I guess you've, you've experienced a sort of Frontline experience in your own home, essentially. 
Um, would you sort of, how would you say that's changed your sense of risk in your own life? Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, I've always had quite a, a high risk appetite. I've been, I would say, extremely careful, uh, but not risk averse. Uh, you know, very much somebody who was happy to take calculated risks when with people I could depend on and, and felt that I could depend on myself. Um, and it was interesting, actually, I, a, a couple of weeks after the explosion, just after I'd had the surgery, there was, I was staying in a hotel and the gas canister in the breakfast buffet exploded while I had a friend staying with me, uh, helping me. And I jumped up to run. And I think I've been speaking to a few people here about it. And, you know, the fact that we sort of, your training kicks in and we reacted, we feel in the, in the right way after the explosion helps a lot in terms of how you assess your capability to deal with risk because you feel that, you know, the proof is in the pudding and you did it. But when this happened, I jumped up to start running and, of course, immediately fell because my foot was in a cast. And psychologically, I hadn't realized that. And I was really affected by that. And it wasn't about the explosion triggering something. It was that feeling that would not leave me afterwards of my entire calculus of my life, of my work is based around my ability to protect myself and those around me and the fact that I trust myself and my instincts. And suddenly not being able to do that changed everything uh, and made me feel very, very differently about it. So I certainly, I think, have a different attitude now. As I said, just, you know, learning the, the lessons, which you do as you spend a long time in this industry. And, you know, the older you get, your body starts to not work as well and all these things. Uh, and when, you know, you really are on your own as a freelancer. So kind of just bearing in mind that, you know, these risks are real, uh, really has kind of uh, affected how I think about things and, you know, the, the work that I'm planning now and certainly, you know, COVID's getting worse in Lebanon now uh, and things like that. So I'm kind of you know, trying to make sure, and even the amount of time that I need to take to make sure my recovery is done correctly so these aren't problems that affect me in the future. Um, but there are just a couple of things, I mean, everything that, you know, everyone said I completely agree with. Um, but one of the other things I think is, the, you know, the front line now being in, in an era where we now have so much misinformation and disinformation being at the coalface and you being the person who is there to show what's really happening. And that's a struggle often because the closer you, you're getting to things, you know, although always there have been dangerous situations to be in, by and large, you know, what was being represented was for the most part by media that, you know, people felt they could trust if the journalists could get there. Whereas now there's so much out there that isn't true, that you feel the responsibility to be there, but you need to be close enough to be able to show it. But then the more you do that, the more danger you're putting yourself in, particularly now that we see so many attacks on journalists. I mean, this was something that we really have faced during the protests here, which was so violent. Um, you know, and you were at very real risk of losing an eye, of having you know, permanent damage the way that, uh, that less lethal weapons, and I did a report on this, were being used, you know, directly tear gas canisters or other bullets. We saw the same thing in Iraq uh, happening. And I have multiple colleagues who were directly fired upon while wearing press gear. Uh, you know, one had a hole torn out, a chunk torn out of his arm. Another one was shot straight in the abdomen while on TV. And you are you're at the front line because you're there showing it, but you're also risking yourself. You're vulnerable because your focus switches, particularly if you're a filmmaker or a TV journalist and your focus is then somewhere else. You know, you really do have to trust your team, but so often we're working alone, uh, that that's really dangerous. And the one other front line I really think there is, is that so much of the nature of our jobs is about, particularly as freelancers, the personal relationships that you create with your subjects. So you're there on the front line of experience you know, trying to take your audience somewhere to understand an issue. And so much of what we do is about creating those relationships, creating that trust, making sure that you are protecting your subject, you're doing the story, you know, in, in a worthwhile way and in a way that doesn't put anyone at risk, um, either emotionally or physically. And with the more risk we're facing now, you know, every time you make that, uh, that decision to go further, to go somewhere that's more difficult to get to, to put yourself into more of a situation which is the unknown because you're trying to get to the real heart of a story. Once again, you're, you're, you're out of front line. And I think that's why COVID has affected our industry so much as well, because, you know, editors, you send around lists saying, well, you know, just take all these precautions and then it'll be fine. There's a lack of understanding there about the nature of that relationship between a journalist alone or in very small teams and spend a lot of time with our subjects and really you know build that relationship that all these factors are putting extra layers of separation there and you every single time that you're in these situations in the same way that you have to think about protecting yourself from a bullet or from a riot policeman or whatever you're you need to think about where's the right level 
of protect yourself and your subject enough that you know something's not going to happen as a result of having made this story that could affect you both for the rest of your lives. Super interesting, Leila. Thank you. And so just to kind of, we're sort of running out of time here and just to wrap up, I've, I've got a question that um, has come in from the audience and um, I want to tie it in with a question from me um, and perhaps I can just go around all of you and ask you these two questions together. Um, the first part is um, from the audience. Do you feel that you have greater political freedom and in your research and reporting as a freelance journalist? And is that something that is it, what drew you to being a freelancer? rather than being a staffer. Um, and then the sort of second part from me on that, and perhaps can be our last round of questions, is if you had one thing to say to sort of, if there was a, you know, a global panel of editors who had the potential to make decisions about freelance budgets and make sure that freelancers were still represented in the media, if there's one thing you could say to those editors about why you think it's important to preserve and protect freelance voices, what would that one thing be? So first of all, is the sort of greater freedom of voice part of the reason that you have chosen to be and decided to remain a freelancer? And secondly, if you could say one thing to sort of this amorphous imaginary group of editors out there about why freelancers are important and what would that thing be? Um, perhaps Monica, I can go to you. Um, so I think, I, like Leila, I mean, we have kind of a similar background. I also come from, I was a staff correspondent before deciding to, you know, be freelance. Um, I don't think I did it for political reasons. I didn't want to be an independent freelance journalist because of political or, you know, I was never really censored or, you know, I have no editorial, which, which was, I guess I was lucky maybe, or, you know, in my particular case, it wasn't that, but it was the freedom to like be able to go deeper in the subjects that were important for me because I was finding that a lot of assignments were not as interesting to me or that I couldn't pursue what I was really good at or you know like if I had access to something I wanted to pursue it and wanted to really you know get deeper into something and I thought you know being staff I, I you know at the time I couldn't do it so I think freelancing if you you know, if you have good sources and if you kind of, you know, keep your mind open and try to, you know, move well, you can have more freedom to do different subject matters and to sort of do it more independently. Um, it also has like more challenges like we spoke to before about, you know, money and financing and all of that. But um, if I had a panel of editors, I would say, yes, please support freelancers. You know, every time you tell us to pitch stories, you know, it takes time to come up with these stories and these contacts and all that time, you know, we don't have a staff job that's, you know, paying us in the meantime to be able to draft all these ideas and come up with this amazing access. I think, you know, they should, you know, I think freelancers, we, we do have better access sometimes, sometimes we don't, but, but we are expected to like, you know, go like to push further and to go, you know, to get like better things than, you know, your staff reporter wrote. That's why people come to us. So I, I would say, you know, it's important that, that you know, they keep in mind that you know we need to be financially supported in order to be able to you know produce and get all these access that you know that a lot of news media rely upon. And also because, as Elijah mentioned, you know we do move faster. I think you know when you when you're a network, there's like almost so much bureaucracy to get started to even go somewhere. You know, a freelancer just does its own risk assessment for the crew and that's it you know you're gone and then maybe you regret it or whatever but you know it's a lot it's a lot faster um so i you know we of course it'd be great to have support and i think you know we get to the source and that's becoming more rare as we've said before so yes uh, please support us that's i guess my message you know to the imaginary editors out there Brilliant. I hope some of them are going to be listening. Oh, real, yeah. Well, there's a the video recording to them. Um, Alicia, what do you think about that? I mean, do you feel that you have more freedom as a freelancer? And, and, and what would you sort of want to say to the imaginary editor panel about protecting the freelance space in the media landscape? Uh, for, for, for the editors, uh, I think this is the right time for them to trust uh, the freelance and not to use freelance as fixers for their reporters or their crew because most of the time freelancers are always used like fixers and sometimes it's kind of for you guys to do what you could have done so this is the right time also for the editors not to start trusting and believing 
freelance can even do better job than what they have in the office mm -hmm. and if they give us that chance we, we will always be in a position to show we can be able to deliver it's a st strong message there one that i fully fully agree with salam how about you well i'm uh, completely agree with what he was saying and uh, Actually, I can say for my own experience, uh, I start uh, as a fixer and then I start uh, working as a cameraman and then filmmaker even after I done multiple film and uh, still uh, they want to hire me as a uh, fixer and you have to, especially if you will start as a local journalist, you have to fight so hard and say no, like say a billion times, no, I'm not. If you want to give me this, uh, this job, I, this is my position. If you're not, I'm, I'm fine. I, sometimes it's difficult to say no because in the end you have to pay your bills. And also what uh, Monica, she was mentioned, uh, when you finish the story and you want to go to editor for another story, you go for a meeting and after meeting and after meeting and uh, after meeting and sometimes take three, four months until they told you, they agree with you for anything and all this uh, time from your bucket and uh, like uh, what Monica said uh, in the end of the day uh, you ca you we not have uh, s some another way to have money we not stop job and this meetings after meeting after meeting is just going for your time and another thing about freelancer uh, like uh, also uh, i started freelancer then i work as a staff honestly i think sometimes if you are a staff you ca you cannot grow that fast you stay in uh, small places and is yeah of course you can grow but i think will take more time and uh, more sh between if you are a freelancer you have the freedom to uh, w uh, do, uh, go to do story you are really passionate about it and give it all the time you want uh, again we come back for time time on board it uh, sometimes yeah i think a lot of time one for the special thing for freelancer we put a lot of other for the story yeah yeah, a lot of effort. And I think that's a very important point that you guys have all sort of reiterated there and something that I think about quite a lot when I'm sort of doing, I, you know, I think of actually lawyers and their billable hours that they start the clock the minute that they uh, are doing anything on a case. And I sometimes think about that when I'm doing my, you know, multiple fifth redraft of something or, you know, seventh phone conversation and thinking, okay, well, you know, that, that, those, that, as, as Monica said on the phone earlier when we spoke, that time is abstract somehow, that time is not counted. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be great if that was if that was recognised a bit more. And I also fully agree. You know, the idea of pushing back on the on the idea of fixer. I think especially a lot of um, people based in their in their sort of home communities uh, get labelled in that way. And I don't think personally it's a very representative or fair uh, term because it doesn't you know sort of also allow people uh, to be recognised for what they're contributing to stories and and films and projects and so on. Um, Leila, what about you? Just as a last thought, and then uh, I'll thank everyone, and we can we can wrap up. On the first question, um, yeah. So I, I also came from a staff job, and I I wouldn't say that I feel that I've been censored, or people have tried to censor me, uh, and I've you know railed against that. Certainly, there's been uh, lots of uh, times, particularly you know I work in a region where everything is a trigger, and all you know publications have a certain way they like to represent things. Uh, you know, be it Hezbollah, Israel, Iran, whatever it is. Um, and I've certainly pushed back against that. I haven't worked with people who've, who've tried to censor me because I think I, I wouldn't um, in the first place want to work for people who might be like that. But certainly something that I'm, I'm extremely fierce about protecting, uh, you know, what I think is the right way for something to be expressed, uh, protecting the fact that the on the ground knowledge is going to be better than what's coming out of an office in London or New York. And it's something that I always say to young freelancers when I speak to them, in my opinion, your reputation is all you have, particularly as a freelancer. And, you know, life and careers are long and one editor might seem very important right now, but they probably won't forever. And in the end, I think it's far more important what your community, your fellow journalists, and the people who live in the region where you're reporting think of your work than 
what an editor who you want to work for their company, but you know, wants it to appeal to a certain audience thinks. And if that relationship's not going to work and they're not going to respect that, uh, then, you know, it's easy to say, obviously we all, we all do need work, but I would encourage people to shy away from that because I do think, you know, building yourself a reputation as somebody who knows what they're talking about and will take the time to do that and doesn't call the easy shots uh, is, is incredibly important in being respected by, as I say, you know, the people on the ground where you work. And that's always, you know, it's most important to me always when I publish a story, what the people around me uh, in the country that I've been working think of it, uh, what their feedback is. So that is certainly what I, what I kind of hold dearest about being a freelancer is that I get to make those choices. And it's up to me to make that call, whether I want to do, to do that work and have it published in that way or not. Um, and to the board of uh, imaginary uh, media offices, I would say, what made you want to be a journalist? You know, that, that storied foreign correspondent years ago who would go off and disappear for a week and come back with this one insightful tale that, that completely explained an, an issue and humanized it for people around the world, you know, at a time when budgets allowed that and don't anymore. And of course you're under so much pressure, you know, to, for the clicks and to cover everything. And, but the reality is think about the stories that you'll remember uh, look around and think, look at the stories that make such an impact and more often than not it will be freelancers who find those stories. Thanks Leila, that's I think a wonderful note to end on and uh, let me just uh, say thank you to all of you for taking the time to join this panel tonight, Leila, Monica, Lija, Salam, to uh, the Frontline Club obviously for hosting it, um, obviously freelance journalism is really in the sort of lifeblood of the Frontline Club and, and it's great to see uh, the discussion being given so much space um, and to all of the you in the audience I can see many of you have stayed stayed with us throughout and, and thank you for doing so on a Thursday evening lunchtime wherever you are in the world so thank you so much for joining and uh, yeah with, with, with all the best from us uh, have a lovely weekend thank you guys uh, thank you bye, <laughs> bye.